Thanks, Ötzi and Guillermo, for the kind invitation to speak today um, about this wonderful book that I've had the pleasure to preview uh, in PDF format. Um, okay. So I don't have slides. I have a couple of stories, I suppose. When I was a child, I was totally into sci-fi TV series like Star Trek, but especially The Land of the Giants, which was made between 1968 and 1970. This one gave me ongoing nightmares that still return occasionally today of being a small human transported by elaborate scientific means to the distant land of the giants where everything is 12 times bigger. A land uncannily similar to my own, only now I am very small. One of the most challenging thresholds in this land of the giants was the curb, off which one was always at risk of falling. And falling off the curb meant plummeting into the street and being crushed by giant vehicles. Such nightmares have come closer to reality these days. Cars, I argue, are the most absurd, if not the most utterly stupid, of all socio-technological inventions. As we have discovered from this clever book, the proliferation of cars has given rise not only to vast infrastructures of roads and highways, on and off ramps, road rage and traffic calming devices, car parks and used, used car sales creeps, post-war cities designed for the car and not for people, go figure, backseat love affairs ending in unwanted pregnancies, <laughs> devastatingly poor air conditions in cities causing poor health and early deaths in vulnerable children, the seatbelt and ridiculous Volvo adverts narrated with the dulcet tones of Swedes speaking to safety and landscape adventures. But also the humble curb. We are asked to take a serious look at the automated car, the driverless automobile, a technology overpromised and underdeveloped, the editors explain. We are to address it together with the curb as a matter of concern. And here we've heard that Bruno Latour will help us get theoretically oriented to understand its network effects, the relations it has entered into, its globally ramifying transformations of urban environments over the last 135 years. Now, apparently we have a German to blame for the car. His name is Karl Benz. I think there's probably disputes about who invented the car first, and uh, I think one of the essayists even put Leonardo da Vinci in there, or maybe that was something I googled. Anyway, Karl Benz, patent number 37435, we have him to thank for the invention of the automobile around 1886. I especially love, though, the story of his wife, Bertha Benz, who took an 105 kilometer journey in 1888 in a patent Benz from Mannheim to Forsheim, which involved, on the way, cleaning the fuel line with her hat pin. I doubt the humble curb has been so honored as the car, at least not up until now, but I also think it's worth reflecting on Bertha's hat pin and her ingenuity and this test ride in one of the first cars. Now, as for the curb, it recedes into the background of our attention right up until the moment we come off our bicycles, have to heave a pram over a high one or a wheelchair, or knock off our car hubcap against its co concrete insistence. The curb is not just an object of political deliberation, it is a participant in a shifting political assemblage, the editors remind us. And this multi-agent or multi-vocal book tells us the curb is, and the book actually is a technology in its own right, of course, um, it tells us that the curb owns an agency, it acts in the world, it's not simply a mute thing. I like this celebration of the humble curb, as you can hear. I'm all for acknowledging this strange animism of things, which demands on us, of course, also um, gathering in strange assemblages and producing these hybrid forums that the editors are talking about. So the car and the curb, it goes without saying, collects around themselves a controversial gathering. The car, as we've heard here and as we know from me the media is well on its way to getting a life of its own with such companies as Waymo owned by Google, Cruise owned by General Motors, Tesla, VW, Uber and so forth all vying with each other to make the future of the autonomous car possible. Now I think it's interesting to note that both with Waymo and Cruise they're based on something like a taxi service, a fleet of cars that are mobilized around a city. 
Whereas something like Tesla is um, dependent on individual car ownership. And so these two different sort of proprietorial arrangements are worth reflecting on, I think. Tesla, I hear from my source, is closing in on the level five autonomous car, which means where most uh, autonomous cars have to articulate their own vision um, with a high sort of res map, Tesla is liberating itself uh, from the map and learning to think on its own. Sharing its, uh, learning to think by kind of engaging in a kind of environmental knowledge that it's amassing through working in the world alongside other Tesla cars. Now, I've got a secret source who's a computer security specialist or was for one of these um, big companies. And he tells me, interestingly, we've got the technology going and so forth, but one of the biggest challenging things is going to be the legislation, the paperwork, questions of security, safety and risk, which we also hear about in the book. And this, of course, means in terms of modes of governance, we really do need to take seriously uh, the Bruno Latour, Bruno, Bruno Latour's idea of a parliament of things where we as humans sit alongside non-humans and deliberate together, as fantastical as that sounds. Now I think also um, we know that something's afoot in the book. We've heard about fiction and criticism in uh, the conclusion and uh, they're discussed in passing in the post um, script. The scene is set in the introduction of the book, tellingly entitled Of Cars and Curbs. And the irresistible association must be made, I can't help it, to the Steinbeck novel of Mice and Men, because the best laid plans of mice and men or of cars and curbs are apt to go awry, and most certainly do. We all know it will end in heartbreak and death and broken dreams, certainly in planetary destruction. Still, what choice have we but to seek solidarity with these new technologies that have overrun us? And I'll conclude this brief offering here by quoting feminist philosopher of science and technology Donna Haraway from her famous Cyborg Manifesto. Our machines are disturbingly lively and we ourselves frighteningly inert. Thank you. Uh, so I'm just going to play this clip uh, while I speak. It's a clip from the Australian film The Cars at 8 Paris and I'll talk a bit about this film later. Uh, but first I want to thank uh, Guillermo and Utsi for inviting me along and congratulations on the publication of Learning to Live Together. It's a, it's a great book. I, um, I've got the PDF version. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's a wonderfully put together book. Um, I love the way it mixes photo essays with, with textual essays and so on and it's inspired a lot of thoughts. Um, so I'm going to offer a few observations in a sort of random and disjunctive manner as befitting the instructions from uh, the authors in the introduction where they encourage skipping around and making use of the various elements as the reader sees fit. So the book has a, a focus on driverless technology and autonomous cars and, some quest and this has sparked some questions in my mind about the role of aggression that has traditionally been displaced through the symbols and meaning of the motor car. So the authors of Learning to Live Together suggest that driverless cars represent the end of human-centred design. It is the death, they say, of a system of architectural conventions based around our own bodies that until now has seemed satisfactory. So my first question or observation is this. What will happen to the human body after being welded to the machine for so long? Will it float free in an airlocked future once our hands are no longer on the wheel? For so long, the cars re rep represented a sort of everyday or or maybe a primitive post-humanism or a post-humanism by stealth. This is vividly illustrated in works like J.G. Ballard's novel Crash, the first Mad Max film, Death Race 2000, the Paul Bartel film, and of course, Cars at Eight, at Eight Paris. These are sort of like the foundational myths of car culture. In each, the viol in each of these works, the violent trauma of the road forces a sort of hybrid life form to burst from its cocoon. Through the simple act of driving, outsourcing mobility to the machine, the body becomes indelibly altered through the instrument of the car crash and the resultant scars become conduits to a new and more intense physicality, accelerated by the logic of the crash and its intimate reshaping of the human form. 
So in these works, we see how we've become so reliant on everyday technology represented by this central metaphor of the automobile that we have in effect, that we have in effect allowed it to colonise our physical selves. Just by driving the car, uh, we have become cyborgs without even realising. But with driverless car technology, in which bodily functions don't so much merge with the machine as become completely replaced by them, <coughs> the question is not one of a primitive post-humanism, but a singularity. This is the moment in which the machine completely surpasses a human and absorbs it until there is nothing left. What new aggressions will be released then? What new conflicts? After being closet cyborgs for so long every time we drive, I can't believe that our rewired physiologies will go so gently into the night when autonomous vehicles come around. I believe there will be strange bodily mutations and reactions, new psychopathologies that will be unleashed once we accept the full reality of our autonomous future of cars. In his book, um, Speed and Politics, Paul Virilio wrote of the many attempts to control the latent aggression inherent in the automobile. And I think his observations are worth repeating as autonomous vehicles creep into our awareness. So, uh, the great automobile, uh, Virilio writes, has been emasculated. Its road holding is defective and its powerful motor is bridled. Just as for the laws on speed limits, we are talking acts of government. In other words, of the political control of the highway, aiming precisely at limiting the extraordinary power of assault that motorisation of the masses creates. Can asphalt become a political territory? Is the bourgeois state and its power the street or in the street? My second observation uh, surrounds Australia's hoon culture and was triggered by um, another passage in, on driverless cars in Learning to Live Together. The authors write... Driverless cars challenge contemporary societal agreements. They defy preconceived notions of safeness, privacy and the accepted norms of everyday life. Their deployment in dense urban areas is already in place, so the need for a framework of cohabitation is urgent. So um, I think I would agree that the issue of cohabitation is crucial um, and I would like to ask what happens to hoons when driverless cars become the only vehicle on the roads? <laughs> Uh, anyone living in urban Australia and probably country Australia will be familiar with hoon culture. In fact, when I was preparing these notes the other night, I did so to the dulcet tones of cars doing burnouts in our street. Um, you might say such rituals perform a specific function. They're, maybe they're a peacock display, a show of strength, two fingers to suburban squares. Whatever, uh, such, in, such rituals are embedded in the Australian psyche. You only have to look at the first Mad Max film to see that. Um, they are allowed to flourish through the technology of the car. Some might say that without this outlet, that aggression would be funnelled into other more dangerous pursuits. So can the act of driving be considered a safety valve, a burning off of antisocial impulses that might otherwise come to haunt us in different ways? Um, in America, farmers have begun to purchase hacked black market firmware in order to bypass um, the computerised John Deere tractors that dominate the farming industry. They do this because they want to take back control of their sovereignty. Normally the tractors are locked down by computer chips so that unauthorised repairs can't be done on them. But with the black market code, farmers are back inside the machine and back in control. Will we see the hacking of autonomous cars by neo-hoons of the near future in order to continue <laughs> their night nightly rituals and reclaim their sovereign rights? Um, Maybe they will hack the cars of others and hoon around by remote control, sending unsuspecting innocents on death rides through suburban streets. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to end by talking a bit about the cars of the day. Paris, where is it? Up to? Oh, yeah, they're driving through the town. Perfect. Okay, so there's a scene in the Cars at 8 Paris that is, uh, I think is prophet prophetic in regards to um, these things I've been talking about. So the film is set in the fictional Australian country town of called Paris, where the um, local economy is entirely predicated and order, ordered around the instrument of the car crash. The locals deliberately manufacture road accidents to ensnare passing motorists. They then scavenge the crash site, cannibalising car parts to make other strange vehicles or using them as jewellery and fetish objects. Any survivors of the crashes are lobotomised by the town doctor and turned into slaves that do the community's menial work. In the background, Parisian hoons rev up their hotted up cars in all night drags. This behaviour is tol tolerated by the locals, with the hoons perceived as a sort of byproduct of the town's peculiar automobile driven economy.
However, one night, the Hoons overstepped the line by destroying the mayor's property during a drag. He then orders the cars of the gang leaders to be burned in the street in what is effectively a public execution of the machine. The Cars at 8 Paris ends in all-out civil war, and you probably saw a bit of it on there where they're crashing through. As the Hoons take revenge, coming back bigger and badder than ever with lethal spike-encrusted vehicles. These monstrous machines destroy the town hall and other cornerstones of Parisian society in an orgy of tyre smoke and gear crashing destruction. What is remarkable about this scene is that the new machining armour of the vehicles renders them completely de devoid of any human agency. Windshields and interiors are obscured and the drivers are never seen again as if they have vanished off the face of the earth. The suggestion that these, is that these vehicles have somehow come alive to e exact their hideous revenge and the soundtrack even comes complete with animal noises as they take centre stage. In essence, these beasts have become autonomous vehicles. They are the return of the repressed. Set to a backdrop of ruins and devastated streets, they are a possible glimpse at the dark underbelly in our looming future of driverless cars. So my final question is this. How might we plan and design for this? What happens to the street when the safety valve of controlled aggression no longer exists? Thank you to both, and it's wonderful to be reminded about that film, and it's got a touch of weak and fright as well, right? That sort of the fear of being stranded in um, rural Australia. So I do have some slides today, partly because I think my topic that, that I the link to this book here, mine is car parking and the curb. It's it is quite visual. So I'd like to thank Simon Ulsi for inviting me along and for the provocation of the book. One of the things that I was most drawn to was this contrast between the idealised future that we're always kind of being sold about, in this case a driverless, uh, a seamless uh, mobility between us and the, the driverless car, autonomous car, and then the reality that actually grounds us, the materiality of it. And part of that is car parking. I guess the curb is next to the car park. Um, <laughs> sorry, this is sort of a purpose of nothing, but I remember having, I had I used to have a Swiss flatmate in Canberra, and he'd just moved to Canberra, and he spoke limited English, thank you, but he was trying very hard, and he looked at the bin, and it said, place bin facing curb, and he said to me, Liz, what is curb? <laughs> <laughs> just vividly remember that. Um, so my world of car parking, I've been studying car parking for maybe five, six years now, and it is that grounding between the idealised car, the idealised mobility, and the now. And these are just some of the images of just how much of a flashpoint the car park is um, and how much people will fight to save their, their spot, their right to the spot. I've got images there, fight the towers or keep your car park by, save this space. So people fighting off change, um, development. Um, in, in that case, on the top right, the idea of paying for parking. There's a fist fight in um, Yarraville. That's one I get to draw on a lot, where um, the traders um, didn't want the parking meters on their street and their efforts to get rid of them failed and it resulted in actually a fist fight at the council meeting. And they beat up the, some of the councillors and then the next morning said, wonderfully in my case. I think it's awful someone got beaten up, but it gave me a lot of... It's a good anecdote to show how much people care about car parking. It's not something that is completely invisible. or It's made invisible by our determination to believe that the car is seamless, but they cared so much that they actually said, yes, we didn't want it to result in violence, but it's like the Arab Spring. Sometimes all your recourses are, are taken up. You have to resort to violence. So Arab Spring in Yarraville there. And I think a, a link to... Um, to the book here today, they've got a quote there from um, um, Elon Musk. He says, oh, what he says, Elon Musk has an awkward problem at Tesla employee parking. So this is a man who's <laughs> he's building the dream, the future. It's the ele electric driverless car, the Hyperloop. He's going to Mars. This is where he's going. This is the reality he's building for us. But in the meantime, he can't find enough parking for the employees. And he hasn't got any other sort of creative ideas for how to solve this problem. And I think that article says like, he lies awake at night worrying about parking. <laughs> so it's that kind of reality of the car park as being the thing that grounds um, us to the car or the earth that really. So the world we've got, the cities we've made with parking, we've got on the one hand just 
an immense amount of space given to parking that we're determined not to see in that quote, we demand convenient parking everywhere we go, then learn not to see the vast unsightly spaces that result. A lot of this is off-street parking. So in the um, images here, this sort of aerial mapping of the space taken up by ground and garage parking off the street. So the one in the middle is um, Buffalo, New York, which is they mapped the parking there and it's over 50% parking. But there's also some aerial images of, or I think a couple of other US cities there, about 30% car park on the ground and Sunshine on the left, it's about the same. So s the seas of parking surrounding the, the building and some of them are so, they're not only vast and unnoticed, but you actually, in my work, I've had to use, uh, in the bottom right image is actually, um, we were experimenting with using machine learning to try and recognise cars and car parks from above because there's so few records on car parks that you have to actually get a machine to try and find them all because there's so many. But it, it comes back to that, you know, the imagination of the car is always in motion, but really there's that st stat there, it's about 95, 96% of the time it's parked. But then because we want to believe it's always moving, we create all these spaces to park it and then try to forget about it. So we've made the off-street space partly through planning requirements. Um, it's quite a regulated space. But the really, um, sorry, and a lot of it there, some images, a lot of it's actually vacant or used to st store stuff. Sorry? Yeah. Too quick. I thought I was like, I'm doing it all wrong. <laughs> sorry, sorry. That's just some images of off-street parking space there. A lot of it is actually vacant, so the apartment parking, um, and that's a, a parking garage in Germany there, so not always even used to store cars. They're put there in the hope that people will use them, um, but often our actual garages are empty or used to store our mountains of consumer garbage. That's, uh, I think, my brother's garage there. <laughs> and. <then laughs> So what's happening from what I, my research is that you have a lot of off-street space and we do, yes, we have a lot of cars, but a lot of that off-street space is vacant or used for storage and the cars themselves are pushed onto the street and fighting for that curb space, that public space that is e ever more um, important and kind of critical and a flashpoint. And even in, and that's a graph there of the um, number of car parks in the city of Melbourne, just the central area, the yellow ones are the on-street space and the blue ones are the off-street. But what people want is that park out the front, and that's where the flashpoint uh, conflict is. We see uh, inner cities where we've remade the curb, the public street, for car parking, middle, median, um, and really um, the competition for that space between cars, other users, bicycles, pedestrians, also uh, retail space, public space, is intense and intensifying. And what we have to remember is that it is still essentially a privatisation of public space. The car is being stored. It's a sort of transport, but I mean, that car in the middle in Brunswick has moss growing around the wheels. Like, this is long term storage in many cases, but so much competition for this scarce space, which is a material space. And I've got there on the, on the left is actually a picture from Germany. We were discussing before that the Germans can be surprisingly um, lax about some things, and I spent some time studying parking in Germany and that's one of the features there is that people park everywhere on the footpath, the bike path, the intersection, um, just anywhere and the two main reasons that they'll give for that are one, I did it yesterday and no one said anything and two, I'll only be two minutes but, <laughs> but it's, um, anyway, that's, that's also not, not relevant. This is a more important, <laughs> important picture here. This is some work I was doing for a, a studio at, at Monash University on a suburb called Braybrook. And what the point I'm trying to make here, I've taken from um, Kevin Lynch's book in the 1970s, Growing Up in Cities. It's actually a, a, a mapping exercise for adolescents about what their world were like in different kinds of cities. And as it happens, one of the cities is Melbourne and the suburb is Braybrook. So they've taken these different streets back in the 70s and mapped all the different things that were happening on the public street or on, on the curb. And that's on the left is that map, and on the top right is the image, it's fairly low resolution, of what was happening on this random suburban street in the 70s. And you can possibly make it out, there's people, kids playing cricket. It's a whole cricket match going on. There's a horse, for reasons I can't ascertain. <laughs> and this is just absolutely normal that children, animals occupy the street. And this is the same street, you know, 40 years later. It is exclusively a, a place for cars and parking cars. The idea that children would play cricket on the street now is, is somewhat outrageous. And that's what we've given up in this kind of remaking of the street and um, legislating the street to be for cars and parking cars. We've also removed all the other actors from it, particularly children. 
And we've done that, you know, consciously or otherwise through regulation and through the powers of the state. So if we look historically, we see parallels with the possible rise of the autonomous vehicle. It's really essentially a variation or extension of the 20th century arrival of the personal vehicle and all the space we made for it. And this is from the 1929 plan for Melbourne where planners are really struggling with the claims of the motorist for the greater facilities persistent and frequently unreasonable. The desire on the part of the owners to use the curb um, was, you know, reaching breaking point. At that point, the images of cars overtaking the city and people struggling to deal with it. The solution, though, was really in many cases in Melbourne and other places was to plan the city to make the, the make it more convenient for cars. And so... By the 1950s, planners in Melbourne are looking to images like that mall from Massachusetts on the lower right as an as a idealised version that you'd be able to park on the outside and then walk in the middle. And they were looking at places like that top left, I think is actually Smith Street, that image there. And they were saying in the 1950s, this is a problem, people can't park easily in these inner city areas, we need to save them and we need to regulate, supply more parking, require more parking make the world more convenient for cars. And that is, in, in a sense, the world we still occupy now. And when... This is a really boring slide, sorry, but it's <laughs> on some, re some recent paper that I found very useful around this idea of what is the curb space. So in this case, not just the physical boundary of the footpath and the, and the road, but what are all the different demands being made on the curb and how are they shifting? And that what we're looking at is you have a world that's already appropriated by the car by a model of 20th century automobility, so storing cars, private cars. This is how we've organised our roads now. And now we have new technologies, whether it's car sharing or the promise of the autonomous car, it's ride sharing, um, all sorts of kind of new mobilities making new claims on this scarce space and butting up against this older model of automobility. So we're having these kind of dual pressures from different ideas of the car as well as other uses of space. So uses of, of the road for pedestrians and cyclists, but also for re retailing and green space and things like that. So that there is no easy way to resolve that tension. There's only a certain amount of space and there's only, you know, all these different kinds of actors make competing claims on it. And we're going to have to consciously reorganise the way we not only think about the street and the curb, but the way we regulate it and legislate it and, and mediate those claims. And instead we do that kind of ad hoc. And I think COVID-19 has really shown how ad hoc that can be and all the different kind of competing visions of what the city could be. And the curb, the street, is where we play out these ideas of the city. The ideal version where everything's seamless versus the we need to have free parking for a month version or else our shops will die. And that's showing that here we've got everything from the retailing version to, you know, the more parking version and any version of the future that, that involves um, financialising or aut automa automating or otherwise involving technology in the street will involve us having to get a much more technocratic, much more uh, legible version of the street than we really have. At the moment, Is the, and perhaps will remain so, a deeply political space that is constantly being renegotiated into which a machine, a car or a driverless car, you know, is, is only one part of that negotiation for space. I think that was it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as always, uh, after hearing your amazing comments, one hope that we had this conversation before we wrote the book instead of the end, <laughs> because there's all these things. And as we say, like the book is just kind of, it's full of holes that have to be filled with uh, all the discussions because uh, the kind of the, the the kind of the topic is endless. And uh, you know, from uh, the kind of the uh, implications that Helen was talking about, uh, legislation, economics, all the way to the kind of um, deep rooted on, uh, on the kind of so social unconscious of the of the thing itself. Simon put out, out all, all the discussion about literally the space they occupy um, are there and uh, but also are missing. I mean, we would love to have. Uh, but uh, one of the um, kind of points of, uh, of the book that I would like to express is this question of the imminent future, right? Something that um, that is happening already that, uh, and I think you all three kind of mentioned that, that point around 
It's not about a future that is far away, but it's something that is happening already, and how we can develop a kind of political or, or mechanisms that by default have to be political to actually deal with all these things. And I, and I, and I would like to know your thoughts of how to, to think about that, uh, or what, how do you think is it possible to actually construct that discussion better? <laughs> the news is getting closer in this discussion, I suspect, on account of the role that Reggie is playing in this debate, I reckon. Yeah. No? I, I can speak to that. I was just reluctant to go first because I was just <laughs> speaking before how to do it. I wish I knew. I mean, partly w one of the sort of things that's hampered this topic has been that kind of determination people have to believe that it's not an issue, that they, as you were saying, Simon, people already hybridise with their car. They think... In the sort of um, planning discussions that I'm involved in, I tend to form the view that people already are cars. When they say, <laughs> I will not be able to park out the front, they are, you're effectively telling them, you cannot even enter this space, that you're, you are your car. So uh, it's difficult to kind of break open that hybridisation that's already happened because it's, it's so intrinsic to people's understanding of how they occupy the city, their rights to the city, and it is often that language of rights and citizenship um, and accessibility around cars. Um, and I don't have any kind of secrets to it. All I know is that it's incredibly... Um, it's a flashpoint. It's incredibly aggravating for people to have to think about parking or the road space at all. I know that um, there's some promise, I suppose, around um, what, what you can do by actually visually changing it, and I think that's where architecture, design and, and interventions can come in. I don't want to be naive about it, but things like the temporary changes to the street space that um, the pop-up parks and things have happened, it's not so much that that's the end point, I think. It just at least provokes people to think about, oh, that actually is space and something else could be there and we could do that differently. How you actually get from there to actually to making a collective decision or informed decision about how we negotiate space, I don't know, because there have been so many cases where it's so explosively unpopular to change anything about the idea that the private automobile has intrinsic rights to all space, that, you know, it's what they call third rail in, in planning, just don't touch it. Actually, in Germany, they said, I think it's different in each country, but there are three things you never touch there. One is dogs. <laughs> um, one is those little allotment gardens that mm -hmm. you don't have here, and the third one is car parking, because you'll just politically die, you'll die on that hill. Um, <laughs> And it, maybe it's bigger than it's bigger than a, it's presented or it's kind of legislated like it's a technical thing. It's, we need this much parking and the road needs to move this fast. And it's a it's something uh, this um, again maybe Latour here like this sort of idealized rationalism that we're all on top of this and it's just something that we can plan for versus this really messy politicized space that's perhaps more about um, hoons and, and identity and cars and and how that actually changes. Maybe, yeah, that's my answer is that I have no idea. All I know <laughs> is that people, people are really upset about anything changing. Um, I'm going to throw to the others on, on some promise. Um, how to get people really actively involved in this discussion is um, without actually um, getting beaten up at a council meeting remains to be seen. Simon, what do you think? Cars that ate Paris? What's the new version of Cars that ate Paris? <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure, but I think in accounting for the future of, say, autonomous cars, we have to consider the Elon Musk factor. Um, and he kind of owns this feature at the moment, and I think that's pretty scary as well, because uh, I, I don't trust Elon Musk. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so I think all of that is really interesting, and, and uh, yeah, we sort of have to enter the, the, the Musk kingdom to acknowledge this, uh, this future. Uh, I don't know how to do that. Uh, no, but the, the, I, I was wondering, like, Planning has been historically in charge of this thing and maybe can be also blamed for the inability to actually move forward as a, a structure of, of, uh, of production of knowledge. Planning um, or, or do you think maybe powerful lobbyists and industrialists who are claiming spaces for their um, technological inventions? I mean... Yeah. <laughs> it's very true that the state, the apparatus of the state has been heavily involved and continues to be heavily involved in serving the purposes of of more powerful interests such as the automobile industry. It's happened already and so that's become the world we're familiar with, is the world that's been made for Mercedes-Benz. I mean, think about 
the car park might be free, but all down the line is an entire industry of creating cars and selling cars to make people need cars. And the new version of the future will be a variation on that. And in a sense, they're just, not just, but it's two, two kind of interest groups, the established and the future version of automobility making new claims on the street. And I don't think planning is innocent of this at all. Things like, I mean, I study minimum parking requirements. That is completely embedded in the in the requirements for how we build our cities. You have to provide parking. And that may seem just, you know, rational and technocratic, but you don't have to provide pretty much anything else. You have to provide the car park. And the, so it's not necessarily planners saying this is the world we want to create, but the planning apparatus of the state is definitely involved in this. And if we maybe if we weren't we didn't plan so much, we might have a better outcome. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> what what about but what about planning for public transport and doing the good work that we have seen taking place in cities on, you know, urban cycling networks, other infrastructures that we can support? We have to get rid of car parking to do it. Mm. And it's and you'll it's really hard. I mean that's <laughs> All of these things are really problematic, I think. So I, I just came back from Barcelona when basically used COVID to get rid of cars. Right? Like they, they basically they locked down and then when the cars were not there, they paint the, the streets, the tarmac in yellow and say like, you're not allowed here anymore. And it's staying like that and it's a big debate of what's going to happen with those kind of interventions. So they kind of um, a strategy, how you call it, like, almost like, you know, a big event, traumatic event that allows to make changes is clearly one, but we cannot keep waiting for more uh, kind of dramatic global events to actually be able to implement that. I was wondering more about the role. Sorry, Sorry. just on that point, and you mentioned cycling infrastructure. Um, I, I read something interesting recently that um, during the lockdown or the pandemic period last year, um, a lot of bike shops were just completely swamped and all stopped. Sort of seemed like this new future of people riding bikes, and you know they've been forced to reset, <laughs> calm mm -hmm. down, and get rid of our cars. But then I read something recently that traffic on the roads after lockdown is now currently heavier than before <laughs> COVID yes. began. Yep. So I just think those, yeah, it's a shame. It's not <laughs> those sort of utopian ideals, um, and it goes back to what you're saying that we can't focus our interest here. And the, ca the car is rebirthed as, you know, yeah. it's not only safe, you know, your Volvo is safe, yeah. it's safe, you know, the safest place from COVID is in your car. Yeah. So the real losers... are using public transport, public transport now, transport. and they're not on their bikes, all those bikes, new bikes are being now rusting in the bus stop. Into the car. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I was wondering if the um, kind of the key would be also expand the idea that uh, planning has failed to welcome for example, narrative or kind of the construction of imaginaries of the city, like basically reducing itself on some sort of expertise that becomes a block, right? Like this is, you know, scientific, it's objective. We know that we need this width to have this amount of cars, this number of stops. And actually the battle, as you, well, you were mentioning, like Telsa as actually the big engine. And we know that a tweet by some guy has more power to transform a city that, you know, 25 planners right now. So how actually claim ownership to over those spaces, I think it's will be key. So th I was trying to ask also how, how you see your your agency as a writer, as an academic in that space, uh, do you kind of, how you bring things to the conversation in that, in that sense? We need to reclaim our capacity for political participation. Um, this is the thing, if we've got like sort of actors who are taking up too much space um, and over determining how the discussion is developing, which is having a real material impact on the ground. We've got to totally somehow, you know, riot on the streets to reclaim the streets. I mean, it's the very public right to the street that's being removed from us. Um, but then, of course, yeah, I mean, as we're hearing from Liz and as, as Simon has sort of narrated so beautifully, it's so controversial. Um, the, and these spaces of controversy, I think, I think, it's, I think what you're try beginning to do with Bruno Latour can be really helpful here. It's like, we're not going to find an easy resolution, but how do we open the space, open up this parliament of things sufficient that everyone at least gets to um, voice their claim uh, for what's at stake or the shared matter of concern? How do we render that visible? Um, that's certainly the challenge. And I'd actually be really keen to know, you know, um, more of your thinking behind some of those theoretical framings for engaging in a car and a curb and this idea of how we're going to get along together. I think Marres argues in the book for some of these 
theaters of togetherness that this research into the wild that I think it's something that I think it could be one of the the ways that could open up the conversation further no like how these things could be not the stage as public uh, experiments of it's not, it's not 19th century science it's a much more messy much more uh, confusing experiments that need to happen in the streets and how I don't know and I don't know what you say yeah I, I think that the test and, and you beautifully put it with the it's like the invention of the car comes with the test comes with the the driving that not by chance is uh, in the hands of the female figure, not the heroic inventor, but actually the one who actually has to do it and has a pin that the allows money. the thing to work, right? Love it, it love it. Loves <laughs> it. It's that fantastic yeah. story. But that proves that actually inventions come with narratives. And uh, Latour in uh, Aramis of the Love and Technology kind of is so good identifying that all these things that seems to be objective solutions to problems are actually a kind of construction of social imaginaries that are carefully crafted and that sometimes somehow they're unconsciously constructed right and and uh what i was thinking a lot a lot of the discussion has been how you actually get a, a certain level of social consciousness around it how you actually make more explicit that these transformations are happening and we are part of them and and those tweets and equally the you know the west connect in sydney or the kind of the the yellow uh, kind of paths in barcelona are part of that discussion and they're not just accidents but actually they're they have to be kind of considered and also discussed and i think that maybe the animism of some of these uh things comes comes there like how you can actually make them speak so one gets conscious of his presence, right? Uh, the test we have done, because I, I think the book, uh, for those of you that don't have the PDF, includes a series of attempts to deal with it, with, the, with inventing new curves, basically. Uh, go in the, into that direction. Curves that not only have a performance in relationship, of the, or, or in relationship to the scans or the sensors of the cars, but actually its presence itself are, make them not mute, right? You know, like they're pink, they're like queer shapes, they're like, they are presented in, in many different ways. And we, we think that maybe, you know, some kind of this explicitness in the street could have an effect, right? Um, trigger. Could trigger discussion. Or exactly, it's not to solve a problem, but actually to get a discussion around how that object could could change things. It's like we need to look for the space that is a few steps beyond the fisticuffs. Mm. How do we get all those actors talking to each other and expressing, you know, what's so thoroughly at stake for them? Get the kind of car lover to recognise that they've become a total cyborg meanwhile and were they aware of that? <laughs> How to find those spaces, which are, are very urgent today for all manner of issues, spaces in which politics can take place. And I think, yeah, that <laughs> kind of bringing it back to planners and the role of, I guess, designers, planners and, 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 and all of us in no longer kind of just being inert, is that the word? You know, we don't, we sh need to find some way and it could be these interventions and sort of playfulness or it's the pop-up things, the urgent, um, you know, the appearance of things without asking first to take it out of that realm of the technical and the idea that it just has its own momentum and it's it's going to happen anyway or that it's that it sort of already makes sense i think any any kind of intervention that's going to get people to think about it and not predetermine an outcome is is something that we really need because the city is being has already been remade around cars and it's in the wake of covid-19 it's sort of quickly reshifting to be remade around cars mm -hmm. in a different way and we could be having these kinds of discussions or having these kinds of experiments and making those risks. But I notice even on the word experiment, like I know I keep bringing it back to the kind of boring reality of politics in Melbourne, but um, even temporary uh, installation of um, reallocated space in High Street Derriban was voted down because it was too, too risky, I think. So if the idea of an experiment's too risky. Risky for the car or what? Yes, exactly. I think they know what they're doing, right? But it's... Um, but do we, do we know what we're missing, I guess? Um, it would be nice if people consciously chose, this is absolutely the preferred version of the city, then that's a, that's a political outcome. But I'm not sure that we all know that we prefer this world, especially when I think about children, and I, that's my little baby out there as well. What's, what am I going to spend the next 5, 10, 20 years worrying about? Her getting run over by a car. And I, I'd like to sort of reclaim a version of, of the world that wasn't um, her getting, you know, 
traversing that boundary space between the place where she's notionally safe and the space that it belongs to the car, it would be nice to actually remake that. Um, but instead, I guess most of us default to, well, I'm going to buy a safer car at the moment. Instead. <laughs> I think this is also, um, I'm really struck by the emphasis on a politics of perception that you both draw attention to in the book. Both the perception that is the non-human perception of what the automated car sees and this re-rendering of the world, but also we could talk about, you know, political perception. Whose perception of the world are we living within when we're living in this um, kind of troubled world of cars, the one that actually constrains our, our capacity to occupy the street? Well, we're living with, you know, a number of key players and industrialists and those concerned, again, with the car industry. And then those of us who've been co-opted with the cyborg kind of visions of liberty and escaping the city and all of these dreams of, of, of what we can do in a car. Um, so uh, I think I think I think the focus on perception has been um, a, a really uh, really powerful approach in the book, actually, um, and rendering that through the image making and so forth. But how do we shift that perception? It's what I would call a dominant image of thought. We cannot imagine the world otherwise. So it is a problem with the imagination, exactly as you were saying. And we do need new narratives and new stories to say, well, the city could also look like this, you know. And yeah. It, it's interesting, and um, I was struck by something. The, the idea of the autonomous car has become so second nature, commonplace now. Sorry. I think she's saying the microphone. I don't mind. think this, this, one's, this one doesn't okay. work. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so the um, you mentioned something in the book about, um, I think you said you started in 2016 to do this, and back then you couldn't escape... Um, Articles about autonomous cars, yeah, yeah. driverless technology, all of that was in all the papers, everything. And now you make the point that you don't hear about this anymore. And I think that's really interesting. And so this has sort of receded. And so this um, question of agency and actors and so on, if it's all receded and become this Elon Musk sort of thing floating on top that we just accept now, I wonder how we can bring that agency back in. We have to bring it back and make it more prominent and raise these issues because I think that was a really valid point that you said and maybe you could talk a bit more about that and yeah. maybe, I don't know I'm worried about time maybe we need to open to the audience if there's any questions yeah. how about we squat the car park <laughs> <laughs> I dig that that's just my and modular curbs <laughs> <laughs> you mean just make the curb bigger just overnight and just sort of or just chuck it in the middle of the road <laughs> 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 Yeah, the automated vehicle would kind of have to respond to the modular kind of installation. Because that's all they can see, right? So they'll come in, it's like, oh, I can't come here. I like that. Yeah, yeah. You guys respond. And or even if it's projected, so it doesn't even really exist and somehow, like, you know, <laughs> the visual field kind of still picks it up, so it kind of just stops. It just goes out and, you know, the, when, when they were sort of bringing in the first sat navs and they had an ad where they ended up sort of at the end of a pier, by accident anyway, you could just, you know, make the curb, make them all drive into the sea. There was, <laughs> there was this artist who did this circle and the car would trap into there so they could never live around there. Basically, if you make a line and run a driverless car, you will never be able to escape. <laughs> because mm. And I guess the market will probably co opt to the Hoons into like theme parks or something where, mm. you know, that's where they'll go. That's right. That's all. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I don't know if anybody else wants to say anything. That's a really interesting point. And I think, so you're referring to the, the car, you know, penetrating the, the mall. Um, the response, design response to that, in some ways it gave momentum to provide more safety for pedestrians, which, you know, again is a funny word. Like, I can't remember who asked that, but at what point did you just become a pedestrian as opposed to just a person? But <laughs> you know, And pedestrian also, you said this, Louisiana, I think. It is also somehow in English is like a, an insult. This is a very pedestrian <laughs> effort. <laughs> so I don't know if that's a... a <laughs> but um, yeah, it's been twofold. On the one hand, it's good because there's been more momentum for really shielding those spaces um, and greater safety, but it also has made that idea of the boundary even sharper. So the response is the bollards. 
we will we'll have to physically restrain cars from coming in and attacking us in, in this area, um, which also signals, you know, our incapacity or impotence perhaps to, to um, tackle it at a, at a broader level. And there is that inherent violence. I know you were saying, Simon, that, you know, the Hoon or in the um, cars at 8 Paris, the car is a safer channel for certain kinds of aggression, but it's intrinsically an unsafe um, technology. It's two tons of metal of um, incredible momentum that can and does kill people every day. And you can use it as a weapon, increasingly is being used as a weapon. And yeah, it's, I'm not sure how, how best we should respond to it, but it's the fact that people are using cars as a weapon around the world means that planners are sort of mobilising to protect some spaces, but it's also, I guess, highlighting how powerless um, you know, our spaces and we are against the car. So I'm not sure what others think about that kind of what's happening with the... And even it's... Um, it was the Beck Street Mall and there was the... Um, where was it? Charlottesville as well. A lot of... Um, I can't even name the number of incidents with, with the car as a weapon. As a bomb. And it's also importantly, there's different um, uh, culpability, legal culpability when you have a car. If you kill someone in a car... It's only if you are drunk or otherwise um, legally incapacitated that you're responsible for that. And we've created that world. Um, yeah, I think <laughs> that's just a kind of dark note, but I think <laughs> 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 to wrap up but to remind everyone that these things are also yeah, still dangerous and all the fictions of security that are constructed in the narratives around automation are still only, you know, constructions as also the kind of and there's the tools that can be used in many ways. And uh, again, I think it's part of the process of being aware of these things, right? Because there is one of the biggest myths around automation of cars is that they will be safe, right? That we, we mentioned there, like actually will less concerned. dead people will come out of this technology when we know that actually that's not necessarily true. Anyway, uh, thank you very much for being here and joining us in this uh, discussion. I, well, the book is available online on the Bathable website for pre-order, so eventually we'll arrive here. Uh, so if you're interested, please check it out. And uh, I think and also here in the book. it will be here <laughs> as soon as uh, canal, the uh, Swiss Canal is open, <laughs> which I hope is soon. I uh, know we, we went in the, the box. The books are in two different um, borders, international borders right now, so probably as soon as the, uh, they're gone through, there will be available thing here. But please join us thanking the amazing panel. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks again to Helen, Simon, and Liz for being much more eloquent than us. Thank you. <laughs>